if we want to define a meltdown, a true meltdown is not an adult temper tantrum, but they look similar. And she's probably accused you of just having a temper tantrum when it really wasn't. I'm not saying you never have temper tantrums, you do. But a meltdown is, as I mentioned, you have this amygdala, which is the fight or flight response. And when you feel threatened, and the amygdala, by the way, doesn't know the difference between a burning house and a mad wife. So when she's upset with you and she's coming at you, especially when she's already animated and wants to solve the problem now, your amygdala thinks that there's danger at hand. I know that sounds like an exaggeration. It's not. Your amygdala is thinking we're not safe right now. And it floods your body with adrenaline and cortisol because it doesn't know that this is, you know, I don't really need to worry about my wife pulling a gun and shooting me. So I'm actually, even though she's mad at me, I'm still pretty safe. The amygdala doesn't know that. And so when you're in the throes of this adrenaline and cortisol, the prefrontal cortex shuts down because it doesn't want to get in the way because that amygdala is there for a reason. If you're at the mall and you see people running towards you and you hear gunshots off in the distance and there's some fucking maniac in there shooting the place up, you want adrenaline and cortisol to hit you hard. So you get the hell out of there. But you're only in danger, even with the craziness that's going on today, you're truly only in real danger about 0.00001% of the time. But you're stuck with this old brain that doesn't know the difference between a mad wife and being chased by a bear. So one of the things you can do when you find yourself starting to melt down is go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's the old brain, the amygdala, thinking that this is a danger level of 10 when it's only a danger level of 0.5. I need to stop, slow down, take a deep breath, and remind my, my amygdala, hey, we're okay. This isn't, a, this isn't a bear. She's not coming at me with a, a, a steak knife. We're okay. When you have that little piece of self-talk right there, that's the prefrontal cortex came back online. When you say to yourself, we're okay, we don't need to be this hypervigilant and paranoid right now, that thought came from the prefrontal cortex. Now the amygdala is going to take a back seat. The new brains online is saying, we're okay. Settle down there, buddy. Mr. Amygdala, we're fine. It's just her being mad again. I don't need to mount the defense or getting all worried, get my blood pressure up. And that whole business I just described, it was prevention because we're preventing from escalating above five, six, seven, and so on. So it's interve intervening early to prevent the larger damage that's going to be done if that thing writes itself out. Well, this sounds so simplistic, but if you do it, it actually helps. When you're in that moment and it comes out of nowhere of high anxiety, the tendency is for your breathing to get real shallow and for your muscles to tense. Mm -hmm. when, when, you, when anxiety strikes, your breathing will get shallow and your muscles somewhere, I don't know where you... Uh, feel your tension. I feel it in my neck. That seems to be the first go-to for my body. Yeah. And you'll you'll probably if you do a little self research, you'll be able to find out where it goes to. Some people's the lower back. Some people's a headache. In that moment, okay, I'm really anxious right now. What's my first line of defense? I'm going to breathe. Not in a way that's obvious, and that people think, "What the hell is he doing?" And I'm going to I'm going to make I'm going to Focus on breathing. And my breathing is not going to be just any old kind of breath. It's going to be, I'm going to physically pay attention to a three second in breath and about a five second exhale. You don't have to use your mouth like that. So it's three in. You can use different combinations as long as the exhale is longer than the inhale. So we'll go three inhale, five second exhale. And if you can combine that with, once you've identified where your muscle tension might be, if, if there is any at all, okay, I'm going to now focus not only on this breathing, but relaxing my neck. Why would you want to do that? Because it re-engages your parasympathetic nervous system. When anxiety hits, you're instantly, you have the autonomic nervous system, and that's comprised of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. When you, anxiety hits you out of nowhere, 
you're going to have an instant uh, pump of cortisol and adrenaline. So you're in sympathetic mode at that point. The, the three second inhale and the five to seven second exhale, along with focusing on what area of my body tends to be tense, re-engages the parasympathetic nervous system, which is uh, rest and digest. So you can cognitively and behaviorally go from fight or flight to rest and digest. And it only takes a few seconds when you get really get good at it. And I would practice that even when nothing's going on. Set a timer on your watch or, or your phone. It goes off, you know, what the hell is this? Oh, that's my reminder to practice this little spur of the moment parasympathetic nervous system response. And so I'm like, So you practice it when things are going fine. So that when something goes wrong, ah, you've already practiced it, you already know. So to you and all the other guys in here, you want to be parasympathetic dominant. Anxiety is a huge issue with ASD. All of you in here are sympathetic dominant. I'm always, every moment of every day, shooting to be parasympathetic dominant. In other words, at least 51% of the time, I want to be in rest and digest, and only 49% fight or flight, preferably more 80-20 rather than 5149. And it's possible, but you have to practice, practice, practice. So let's practice this now. We'll do five repetitions of three seconds in and five seconds out. Inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five. Inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five. Inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five. Inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five. Inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, one, two, three three, four, five. So for those neurotypical spouses out there that still don't quite fully understand autism spectrum disorder and just view it as this complex puzzling maze of confusion, you can think of it like this, and this is very much in the ballpark. Don't forget this phrase right here. It's a problem with imagination. Your autistic spouse has great difficulty and imagining what you might be thinking. And then when you explain what you are thinking, he has difficulty understanding why you would think that way. With problems with imagination, he's gonna have a hard time imagining what you might be feeling. And when you explain what you're feeling and why, he's still gonna have a hard time understanding that. There's this thing called theory of mind. And what that phrase means is we all have the ability, if we're neurotypicals, to predict others' behaviors. Not exactly, but certainly in the ballpark. We can hypothesize about what others' belief systems might be based on what they've said or their past history, what their thoughts might be on certain subjects, what their feelings might be in certain situations, what their behaviors might be if such and such happens. We can somewhat predict these things, especially if you're very intuitive. But with the autistic brain, the business of predicting and imagining is absent. And as a neurotypical spouse, if you've tried to explain your thoughts, feelings, actions, and you got nowhere, is because your explanations didn't remove the problem of imagining. Your pleading, negotiating, trying to reason with did not help with your autistic spouse's lack of imagination skills. If you explain your feelings, he still has to imagine why you would be feeling that way. Same problem. So when you're trying to make sense of this very confusing and somewhat disturbing behavior coming from your autistic spouse, don't forget this video. Never forget this phrase, lack of imagination. It's not, he's insensitive, uncaring, selfish, narcissistic, doesn't care, you're not important to him. No, he can't imagine what's going on inside of you. 
He can't peel himself out of his skin, crawl into your skin, look out of your eyeballs and view the world like you do. Or we should say he can't imagine what it would be like to view the world as you do. But you, as a neurotypical spouse, you have that ability. You can imagine what it might be like to be somebody else. You can imagine what that person might have thought and felt during a difficult situation. Your autistic spouse doesn't have that skill. Now you can continue to hold that against him and you can continue to try to get him to get it. In this case, it is the skill of predicting and imagining fairly accurately. Good luck with that. The two things that I run into is He's hypersexual, and there's no emotional component to it. The other thing I run into is he's hyposexual. He's just not interested. And that's that's usually the conversation that comes up 80% of the time. The hypersexual comes up maybe the other 20. Uh, two different problems in one sense, but the same problem in another sense. And that is we're back to this business of mind blindness and emotions blindness. He's already challenged dealing with you because you're his significant other, and it requires a lot of social skills and emotional intelligence to deal with you because you're way up here with social and emotional intelligence, skills, and needs. Social and emotional situations fall outside of his comfort zone. He probably functions fine at work when he's talking about it's all task-oriented, it's all work-related, Maybe it's also a special interest. So he's in his element there, but when he's out of his element and needs to be firing on all eight cylinders is when he's with you. He doesn't have eight cylinders. Then the, your question was, how do you get the emotional component involved? You certainly should have the thought, this guy is not purposely, it's not like he has the emotional component and he's withholding it from me or that he doesn't want to incorporate the emotional component. It's quite honestly the other end. He probably wishes he had it and probably wishes he could include it. And so one of the thoughts that I would have if I were in your position would be, this guy is not withholding emotions. He doesn't have the brain wiring to meet all of the criterion for meaningful sex. And so it's not like he has the emotional component, but he's withholding it. He doesn't have the emotional component. He's not withholding anything. He just didn't have it to give. A, a guy who's hypersexual and only interested in the physical component and is unable to deliver the emotional component, and then she's wanting the answer of, okay, well, how can I get him to be mind-sighted and, and emotions sighted and empathic? That's like asking me, how can I get my bipolar daughter to just have a totally level stream of serotonin so that there's not a manic phase and a depressive phase and she's just perfectly even keel? If she has that disorder, then unless she's medicated, and even then there's going to be ups and downs with her brain chemicals that keeps her from being polarized one end and polarized on the other end. So when we're talking about disorders... Um, we're talking about some things. That's why they have, that's why they call it a disorder. That's the whole reason they call it a disorder is because it causes problems in daily functioning. And having meaningful sex with your spouse would be considered one aspect of functional daily things that should be going on. Oh, things are going really well. Now. Oh, no. That means things are going to take a turn for the worse at any moment. Why would he have that thought? Because there have been times in the past where things were going well and he took, he breathed a sigh of relief only to find out that things just got worse again, fast. Not that it happens yep. every time. It's probably happened the vast minority of times. But the amygdala took note. The amygdala took its piece of paper out and wrote it down. Okay, in the future, when things start going well, be on alert, because therefore that simply means things are going to go to shit in a, in a second. The, the amygdala, by the way, is trying to protect you. It's good that we have it. If uh, you were on a boat, the boat was sinking, you would want to have cortisol and adrenaline going all through your body. But you're only in danger about 0.0001% of the time nowadays. 
And you're never in danger with her unless she's pointing a gun at you, and it's loaded. But the amygdala does not know that. It's on high alert because it doesn't want you to die. That's why we have the amygdala. It's, it's a survival mechanism. We got to get the hell out of here. The house is burning. But it doesn't know the difference between a burning house and a mad wife. So just because things went well and then they went bad uh, several times, probably in the past, the past does not equal the present. And as soon as Esteban catches himself, oh, wait a minute, I'm, things are going well. My amygdala just came online, and now it's predicting that because things were going well, therefore they're going to go bad soon. That thought right there in that second was prefrontal cortex. The amygdala got silent again. The prefrontal cortex talked to the amygdala, calm down there, buddy. We're okay. You're just getting worked up because sometimes in the past things were going well and then they did turn bad. But that, the past is not the present. I'm okay. That's why I say talk to your amygdala. Why would I want you to do that? Because when you talk to your amygdala, it's the prefrontal cortex that's doing the talking. You are now in the new brain. We have a question from an NTY. wife. She says, my husband either is a narcissist or has autism spectrum disorder, or it might be something else. I don't know how am I supposed to know. Well, people with ASD level one, which is high function autism, experience a lot of different difficulties and not to complicate the situation, but many of these difficulties are associated with other things. There's a huge crossover between narcissistic personality disorder and ASD. The same thing could be said with obsessive compulsive disorder. So it's kind of hard to just uh, guess. It would be best to go get a diagnosis if he were to be willing to get an assessment. But ultimately, ASD is hard to diagnose and is frequently misdiagnosed. So some of the things to look for, if he does indeed have ASD level one, would be cognitive difficulties. Frequently, the person on the spectrum experiences difficulty with empathizing with others and may say inappropriate things because he fails to consider others' feelings. A significant problem for the person on the spectrum is mind blindness. And mind blindness occurs when he is unable to make inferences about what others are thinking. And it also hinders communication with others. Another thing that you will find if he does indeed have ASD level one will be a narrow range of interests. If the individual on the spectrum seems stuck on a certain topic and seems a bit obsessed and seems to always be talking about that topic, he demonstrates narrow interests and this is a trait of ASD. And it's not uncommon for the person on the spectrum to learn everything he can about this special interest. And then he may feel compelled to share information about that topic with everyone around him. He may even interrupt when somebody else is speaking so he can switch back to his favorite topic, which is his special interest. And obviously, focusing on narrow interests affects social interactions negatively. Another thing that will come with the package of ASD Level 1 would be difficulty with social interaction. So although the autistic person may want to interact with others, he lacks the social skills to get it done effectively. The person may fail to understand both verbal and nonverbal cues, and communication with others can break down as a result. The ASD individual may lecture others, he may fail to ask questions to continue a discussion, or simply not even acknowledge the other person by looking at them. The desire to communicate may be there, but the language abilities others seem to develop naturally just don't develop easily for the person on the spectrum. Another thing that will tend to come with the package would be motor clumsiness, sensory sensitivity, the need for routine. People on the autism spectrum crave structure. They thrive on routine because things that show up in an impromptu fashion throws them off. They don't like change and they don't like surprise change. Some other things that would come with ASD Level 1 would be having a high level of vocabulary and formal speech patterns, peculiarities in speech and language, such as lack of rhythm, odd inflections, or in monotone, taking figures of speech literally, downloading even neutral comments as offensive and as a personal attack. So if most, if not all of that sounds familiar, then we're probably talking ASD Level 1. If most of that does not really fit your husband, then it's probably something else. So how would the NT wife, in this case, download some of these things? 
she might download the mind blindness stuff as my opinions are not important to him. He's rigid. It has to be his way or the highway. With the Alexa Thymian, she may download, and justifiably so, download that as he doesn't care about my feelings. And when I tell him how I feel, it doesn't matter. He seemed insensitive, selfish, narcissistic, and so on. Uh, some of the executive function deficits, we'll use working memory as an example. If you say something and, and he said, yeah, I'll follow, yeah, I'll do that, or whatever, and he doesn't follow through, it's not that he necessarily lied to you when he said he's going to follow. He's, a lot of times he forgets, but she may download that as these things that, I, that are so important, it doesn't matter to him. He's only concerned with his agenda, his special interest. The other stuff that needs to be done, which there's a bunch, it just doesn't fall in his radar. And with the anxiety, you're going to witness some version of meltdown or shutdown or false agreement, which is he just agrees with whatever you say to her and gets you to shut up. Yeah, honey, yeah, sure, right, right, yeah, 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 I'll get it, I'll do it. And it's not that he's necessarily lying. He's wanting her to get the conversation over with because he's escalating. With meltdowns, shutdowns, and false agreement, she might view that as, I'm not important. We can't talk about any difficult things. I've given up on trying to talk about the really problematic stuff, the really heavyweight topics, because it always ends in a shit show, and all these problems are just piling up in the closet. None of us getting resolved. So she, justifiably so, realized, hey, this guy's just not a team player at all. He's a solo player that just happens to be married. And it's not just those four, but those four right there, mind blindness, emotions, blindness, executive function, deficits, anxiety, contribute to a good 80 to 90% of the problems. We could throw in a couple others as a side note, sensory sensitivities. In the majority of cases, he had his own childhood abuse issues, maybe had been labeled a, a problem child by parents, problem student by teachers. No doubt at some point, if, if he has ASD level one, he was quirky and odd and tried to get acceptance in his peer group, didn't work, maybe was rejected, ostracized, teased, bullied. And so he decided, I evidently my relational skills suck, and he stopped trying. And that's when he gravitated towards special interests and tasks. So now, as an adult, he has one or maybe two, usually just one special interest that he spends an inordinate amount of time with, it's not that he doesn't care. It's just that he, he can't wrap his brain around things that are laden with social and emotional intricacies because he doesn't have that wiring. Dealing with you, his significant other, where this bond is laden with social and emotional intricacies, he has to be firing on all eight cylinders. He ain't got eight cylinders. And you might be thinking, well, I don't understand because he does find everywhere else. If his work is his special interest, he's functioning in that workplace literally as a neurotypical. But when he comes home to you, or now, social and emotional nuances are introduced into the equation. He's lost. I'm not saying he's stupid. He's probably smarter than me. But that's his weakness right there. The social skills and emotional literacy are his two deficits. And where do you have to have your social skills and emotional literacy up to par more than anything else? With you, his mate. So in working with neurotypical spouses, she will often say things like, he hurts my feelings, and he doesn't care. I'm not important to him. I feel devalued, and so on. But if you have a, in this case, a husband with ASD level one, you have a husband who has blind spots. He has blind spots in his mind. In other words, he can't see your perspective, and if you explain your perspective, he can't understand it if it doesn't meet up with his logic. He's going to have emotions blindness, which means he's out of touch with his feelings and your feelings. And when you tell him how you feel, that doesn't erase the blind spot, he's still not going to understand why you would feel that way. He's not hurting you, ladies. He doesn't have that kind of power. He can't make you spit. He can't make you stand on your head. He can't make you mad, sad, glad. You've given him way too much credit if you think that's what's going on. What's hurting you is your assessment of his motivation. Your judgment call on the purpose of his behavior is what's hurting you. If you have the thought, he doesn't understand how I feel, therefore he doesn't care how I feel. It's that thought that is hurting you, not his behavior. It's your evaluation of why he's behaving in a particular way that is causing the hurt. He's blind. He never had the thought, okay, 
I need to spice my day up a little bit. It's been kind of boring. I want a little drama and chaos. And I am a little bit on the sadistic side. So what can I do to make my wife feel very unimportant and devalued? He doesn't have that thought. He would like to see your perspective if he could. He would like to see and understand your emotions if he could. He can't. And so if you're going to assume that because he doesn't see how I feel and because he continues to ignore my feelings, then you're going to continue to be hurt, but by your own thoughts about what's going on. Now, I'm not saying that this necessarily makes his behavior hurt less, but it certainly should make you take it less personally. If a blind man stepped on your foot repeatedly, I don't think you would have the thought, this guy doesn't care about me. He keeps stepping on my foot. He's so insensitive, uncaring, selfish, narcissistic, and so on. No, instead you might have the thought, okay, well this guy simply can't see my foot, and therefore I need to remove my foot from his path. So to translate this analogy, you need to remove your heart from the line of thinking that you have that because he's doing these things, therefore he's doing them intentionally and he's doing them because he doesn't care about me. That's not what's going on. And if you think that's what's going on and you try to convince yourself that that's what's going on, that's what's hurting you, that thought. Yeah, and another interesting thing with ASD, if we're talking about cortisol, and I'll keep, the, this is kind of tangential, but it's worthy of mention, is a lot of times with ASD, you don't get that cortisol boost in the morning the neurotypical brain will wake up and within a minute or two, there'll be a big spike in cortisol, which is intended because um, it, it's mother's nature's or God's way of when you wake up, you want to be alert. You don't want to be groggy. You know, let's think, let's think 10 million years ago. You don't want to wake up and kind of be half conscious and, and groggy and tripping around trying to, to wake up. Uh, that could be deadly. You want to wake up and you want to be alert, hit the hit the ground running. And then as the day wears on, you know, usually about 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or so, that cortisol comes way down and flatlines. <clears throat> People with ASD, they don't get that cortisol spike in the morning. And so it's not uncommon for some of them to be a little groggy when they wake up, and then they're just kind of groggy from that point forward. But... Since they have anxiety, the cortisol and adrenaline is a little above baseline from the neurotypical. So a neurotypical will get a big cortisol spike, I'm looking at a graph with my hand here, and then it'll go way down flatline from about 9, 10 a.m. the rest of the day. The ASD brain, it's almost flatline. It's like I wake up, I don't get the cortisol spike, but I don't get this cortisol decline as the day wears on. On the one hand, I want to be there at moral support, but on the other hand, when she starts getting animated, it's it's flashback time for me. Yeah. I know I'm not the one in trouble, but my amygdala doesn't know that I'm not the one in trouble, and it's starting to come online. And so the, I think the best thing to do would just be honest with her, and the, the, your line could go something like this. I want to be a moral support to you. But I have to tell you that sometimes when you're upset, even though you're not upset with me, I start having flashbacks, and that's the magic term. That's what we're talking about. It is exactly a flashback. I start having some flashbacks because it reminds me of when you were upset with me. And so would it be okay if when I start getting flashbacks and now my anxiety is coming up, I know that you didn't do anything wrong because you're not upset with me, but just feeling your energy is triggering for me. So if I get on a scale of 1 to 5, a 2.5, would you feel like I'm just trying to shut down the conversation and I don't care about the fact that you're upset? Would it be okay if I took a bit of a time away to calm down, maybe get down to level 1 or so? and then come back, and then I want to hear the rest of your story and ask her if she's okay with that. If I leave for a little bit because I'm kind of having flashbacks, please don't download that as I'm not interested in your life or that I don't care about your problems. That's not the case at all. 
It's just, I kind of have to take care of my mental health. So a lot of spouses on the autism spectrum have what I'm just going to call learned helplessness. And this phenomenon occurs when the autistic spouse comes to believe that he has little or no control over the relationship difficulties. And that whatever he does to try to change a bad situation is futile. So as a result, this discouraged spouse will stay passive in the face of any unpleasant, harmful, or damaging state of affairs, even when he actually does have the ability to improve his circumstances. Now, learned helplessness can be thought of as believing you are incompetent, that you have no control over the outcome, that it doesn't matter what you say or do, since outcomes no longer depend on actions, and that your actions are pointless. So in order to qualify for this learned helplessness, the person on the spectrum really needs to have these three conditions in place. He has to become inappropriately passive, and this passivity has to follow exposure to numerous unresolved arguments with his spouse, and there is a change in the way this person thinks about his ability to control similar future marital conflict. The spouse on the spectrum with learned helplessness has certain rationalizations and self-talk that could go something like this. Adopting a passive stance provides me with a sense of control over my life circumstances. Beating my head against a brick wall wastes time and energy and is potentially harmful. Hope has its limits. Persistent attempts to control the uncontrollable are futile and remaining passive allows me to conserve energy when the evidence tells me there is simply nothing else for me to do. So when a spouse on the spectrum feels like it doesn't matter what I say or do, it's never good enough, and my attempts to work on the relationship make the problems worse, this individual will tend to have an external locus of control. For example, he may say things to himself like, I have no control over what happens to me or what happens in this relationship. And he will tend to view unwanted outcomes as permanent. For example, because we couldn't resolve the most recent conflict, therefore we probably won't be able to resolve any conflicts. So we could say that this individual is easily discouraged and somewhat pessimistic. And so he will attend to highlight and emphasize risks. He will highlight problems, is likely to suffer anxiety and depression, is overly concerned with safety and currently does not feel safe in the relationship is often very passive, which would take the form of shutdowns. He will tend to promote caution, critical thinking, skepticism, and defensive measures. He will recover slowly after an argument, if at all, and quite honestly, he simply feels defeated and stops trying. So this individual needs to realize that there is this other thing called an internal locus of control, which is, I do have control over circumstances. I can't control everything, but I can control me. I can control my responses. I do have some ability and power in this relationship. And he also needs to understand that the vast majority of things are not permanent. Rather, they are temporary. Hey guys, this is Mark. And if you're in a neurodiverse marriage, you have probably noticed that you have a hard time resolving conflict. And the problems pile up in the closet. And they've been piling up for how long? Several years, decades. And so the reason that you're having a hard time resolving some of these marital issues are as follows. I have discovered in years of counseling couples that the main reason you don't resolve problems is because you try to fight too many problems at once. How's that been working for you? You haven't even been able to resolve one problem, let alone three or four at one time. Come on now. So the first order of business here to get you started on resolving conflict is for the two of you to sit down and pick a problem and try to address that one only. Which brings me to my second point. The two of you need to treat these conflict resolution moments as a business meeting. So that's point number two. You're going to have a business meeting. You're going to treat one another the same way you would a coworker at work. You're going to then come up with one problem that the two of you agree is one of the top three problems. That's three things now, people. Pay attention. Let's create a business meeting. The two of you are going to agree on a problem that lies in the top three, and you're only going to work on that one problem for now. The other thing that gets in the way is the two of you will tend to want to try to resolve a problem when you're already mad. 
Dumb idea. That's point number four. When we have this business meeting where you're addressing one problem that the two of you agreed is in the top three of all the problems, you're only going to discuss this when you're calm. Now we have four points now. Are you paying attention? The fifth point. We said we're going to conduct this like a business meeting. There's this thing called taking notes. You want to write this stuff down because you won't remember what you said next week. And somebody's going to say, no, I didn't say that. Or no, we didn't agree to that. Or when did we talk about that part? Write it down so that when one party says, no, I didn't say that. Or we didn't talk about that. You go to the notes of the meeting. You look and you go, see, yeah, we did talk about that. We did say this. We said exactly this and we wrote it down. And you agreed to such and such. Write it down. You need proof. You need accountability. You need something that will help you to remember what the hell you said. Now, I understand this isn't a problem-solving strategy in and of itself, but at least it begins the process. If you can't even begin the process, then you're getting nowhere fast. So let me recap. Pay attention. You're going to make a business meeting. You're going to take notes. The two of you are going to agree on what the main problem or at least one of the top three main problems are. And you're only going to deal with that one. You know, the family is a business in a sense. You're, in many cases, if if not most cases, you're raising children. You're trying to keep a household. You're paying bills. You're maintaining property and vehicles. It's a business in the fullest sense of the term, if you think about it. And so when you're trying to resolve marital issues, and the two of you are partners in this business, you have to treat it like a business. And people in the business meeting don't go into the meeting talking about how they feel about things. They don't go in expressing anger, resentment. They don't go in throwing blame. They try to be politically correct. They try to be open to compromise. They try not to offend anybody because they want their points to be well taken and they want their goals to be accepted. And so they present their case very tactfully as should you. If you will do these things, I can promise you at least the two of you can get to the table and start discussing some things. Well, pornography can create a powerful, we'll just call it a biochemical rush. So when the individual is subjected to an arousing image, the adrenal gland secretes epinephrine into the bloodstream where it proceeds to the brain and locks the image in. Now, once this has occurred, the simple thought of the image can trigger a feeling of arousal. Many porn-addicted adults can still vividly recall the first pornographic image to which they were exposed as a child or a teenager. Other body chemicals, you know, like serotonin, adrenaline, endorphins, dopamine, and so on, are also at play, creating a uh, euphoric state. So people who experience this biochemical thrill will not surprisingly want to experience it again. Therefore, it's helpful if you are the spouse of someone who's porn addicted to see pornography not just as a social issue, but as a drug. Because the addictive mechanism is clearly part of the danger when, in this case, your autistic husband habitually views pornography. One of the things that uh, neurotypical spouses do that I would view as a fundamental mistake is when they're trying to deal with, you know, a husband in this case who's addicted to pornography, is that they either willingly or inadvertently reveal or even attempt to impose their own moral values and even religious values. I think this is a mistake because we're talking about an addiction here, not a moral failure. So to the NTYs out there, never make assumptions about your porn-addicted spouse, or try to impose personal, religious, or moral viewpoints, even if you feel like it might be in his best interest. Even therapists sometimes will make this mistake of confusing addiction with some type of moral weakness. Therapists sometimes fail to understand the power of the compulsion that the porn-addictive individual is facing, and it's not uncommon for private sector therapists to advocate a simple treatment plan that is based on willpower or moral character, I think this is a mistake. Since pornography can be an addiction, this just say no type of approach 
is likely to only create more frustration and self-defeating thoughts in the person who does not have the willpower to stop. For these individuals that can no longer control their actions, the intervention and treatment modality must recognize the problem as a full addiction and treat it with the same consideration given to alcohol or drugs. Many of these adults who are developing compulsive pornography problems do so in agonized isolation, often believing that they're perverts and alone in their actions. So it can be helpful for both therapists and NT spouses to educate them on the prevalence of the issue while still clearly communicating the dangers so they don't trade their isolation for a, oh well, everybody else is doing it too type of attitude. And lastly, for people who are struggling with pornography, shame is a major, major factor. So one of the things that I try to do as a therapist is to minimize shame by being supportive and non-judgmental about the struggle. And so should you as the NT spouse. It's an addiction. He will need help. He will need outside assistance to deal with that. Self-help strategies tend not to work and the NT spouse's interventions usually make a bad problem worse. So why does your partner with ISD level one seem to prefer spending more time with a special interest than with you, the neurotypical spouse? Well, for all people with Asperger's or high functioning autism, life is divided into two categories, preferred and non-preferred activities. Preferred activities are those things your spouse engages in frequently and with great intensity. However, not all of his preferred activities are equal. Some are much more highly desired. An activity that is lower on the list can hardly be used as a motivator for one that is higher. For example, you, the NT spouse, will have great difficulty getting him to substitute his computer time by offering a social reward. For example, accompanying you to a family get-together. If the computer is higher on his list, an activity that is non-preferred will often be avoided as long as possible. For example, doing chores, going to the grocery, watching a boring movie with you, and so on. The lower the activities are on the list of desirability, the more he will resist and avoid doing them. Now, sometimes an activity becomes non-preferred because it competes with one that is much more highly valued. For example, going for a walk with you could be enjoyable, but if he is reading at the moment and reading is higher on his list, he will not likely stop what he's doing to go with an impromptu walk. Most often, preferred and non-preferred activities are problem areas in the relationship. Your autistic spouse will always want to engage in preferred activities even when you have something more important for him to do. For example, watching the kids while you run an errand. He does not want to end preferred activities and your attempts to have him end them will likely cause conflict. If many non-preferred elements are combined together, the problem can be a freaking nightmare. For example, going shopping with you, then stop by to see his mother-in-law, then back home so he can fix the water leak under the kitchen sink and so on. Also, family vacations where his routine is totally disrupted for a rather lengthy period of time can also be a nightmare. The person on the autism spectrum rarely has activities he just likes. He tends to either love or hate an activity. The middle ground is usually missing. Now, obviously, you would like your spouse with ASD to experience new things to see if he likes them. But he may not want to do this just because you're asking him to do something new. People on the autism spectrum usually hate change. They usually hate deviations from their routine. He already has his list of preferred activities and will rarely see the need for anything new. Now, I know that this is not such great news because the autistic spouse who's engaging in his special interest to the exclusion of all else is emotionally unavailable much of the time. Many neurotypical spouses assume that the emotionally unavailable autistic spouse chooses to reject intimacy because he has fallen out of love. This is not the case. Remaining emotionally distant is rarely a choice. It's more like a case of social ignorance disease, which is also called mind blindness, that often operates at a subconscious level. When you 
have, well, we'll just call it an adult temper tantrum by yourself in your car, um, you're discharging a lot of negative pent-up energy, which is anxiety. Right. Anxiety is right. negative pent-up energy. And so you are a pressure cooker in your car, and you don't want to keep the lid on that thing and then come home. You want to open up that thing, and this is you yelling and cussing and spitting right. on the windshield and everything. And <laughs> by the time you get that... So you're discharging this negative energy, and then by the time, if you do it really well, by the time you get done venting yeah. and having an emotional vomit right. on your car seat, uh, you have spent all of that negative energy, and there's nothing to take in the house once you walk through the front door. Now. And I would rate your release. Which mm -hmm. it's, an, it's, a, it's venting, a release. Mm -hmm. It's an anxiety reduction strategy. Right. I, would, I, would, I would rate it. After you do it, I, on a scale of one to – this will help you predict whether you're going to carry some of it in the house. On a scale of one to five, one being, well, that was kind of a half-assed vent. <laughs> I didn't quite cuss enough, and uh, I only had one person driving next to me that looked at me like I was losing my mind. So um, I'll give it a one. Right. Then you know, okay, on a scale of one to five, five being, yeah, I totally unloaded there in the car. So if I only got a one or a two, I'm gonna have to, I'm I'm at risk. I don't have to do anything other than when I walk in the front door, realize I haven't totally discharged. Okay. And so I'm I might want to be careful about if somebody says or does something that re-triggers me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have a a right. quick knee-jerk reaction to that because I haven't fully let all the steam out of my uh, teapot. You can't find hope in just one person. In this case, him. <clears throat> That's putting all your eggs in one basket. That's very dangerous. It's giving him too much power. You know, he has to say certain things in order for me to be happy. He has to do certain things in order for my self-esteem to be intact. He has to live up to my expectations, or it results in my depression. Or he has to avoid saying or doing certain things, or it uh, damages me in some shape, form, or fashion. And you have, and I'm not faulting you, because you thought you married a golden retriever, but you married a lone wolf someone who is very independent, autonomous, low in social and emotional skills, low in social and emotional needs. So for you to make your happiness, joy, peace of mind, whatever, contingent upon what he says or does, that's like taking a pile of $100 bills, your hard-earned money, and putting it out there on the street, praying to God the wind doesn't blow it away. You can't put yourself at that kind of risk anymore. You can't count on him, can you? I'm not saying he's failed you 100% of the time. You can't bet on him to follow through. You wouldn't be here if he always followed through. And if the, I'm not trying to trash him. He's probably a good guy. I would probably like him fine. He's probably smarter than me. And it's not just him. You honestly can't count on anybody, any one person. Now, there's some people that you, you feel like, yeah, they're pretty safe. They pretty much come through for me all the time. They're always there for moral support. So, But even those people might get sick and die. I'm not saying just when I say you can't count on anybody, I'm not saying that they're always going to let you down purposely. But I know I've adopted the philosophy a long time, but I can't count on anybody because they might move, they might die. Uh, they might get sick. They, there's so many different things that can go wrong. You, you, don't, you don't want to, at this point forward, don't put your eggs in one basket ever again. Unless you're a, a believer, which I am, certainly can count on God. He's not going anywhere. He's not going to get sick. He's not going to move to Tahiti. He'll be around. So we want to find hope somewhere. Uh, and by the way, that's your job. You're hunting down hope is your responsibility. Happiness, finding happiness, your job. You need to realize that you have a lot of control 
in spite of all the mess in this marriage, you have more control than you're actually giving yourself credit for. And you have the power to create a new future. Some of you may not believe that, but just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not the case. Uh, her resentment is not your problem. You can't make her mad, sad, glad. You can't make her spit. You can't make her stand on her head. You can't make her forgive you. You can't make her let go of resentment. She chose, I hope she's listening. She chose resentment. You didn't make her feel resentment. She chose it. Her resentment is her responsibility. That goes into the filing cabinet called, I don't have any control over that. You have control of your behavior, and you're here. You're making a good faith effort to shift gears from this point forward. You have control of that. But her resentment, she has a laundry list of problems that she has with you, and she's ruminated over all these problems, and she's probably accused you of, of being a narcissist and so on. She has fed her own resentment. And if she holds on to bitterness and resentment, that doesn't hurt you. She might be in the other room thinking how pissed off she is about you. That's, you don't even know what she's thinking. Her resentment only hurts her. It's her feeling, not yours. You can't make her stop being resentful. Now, if you follow the suggestions that we're learning in this group, there might be a happy organic consequence that her resentment level loosens up a little bit. But you're not doing this to re reduce her resentment. You're doing this for you. You're doing this to reduce your relationship anxiety so that you can, so that you can be a better team player in this marriage. This is all about you advocating for you, you doing strategies for you. And yes, there might be, there will probably be, and hopefully will be some secondary benefit for her, of course. But that resentment thing, that's not, that's her problem. You can't make her feel any particular way. Sometimes he is a little clumsy in bed and uh, he has to do the same position all the time. Or maybe he comes off to her as a little mechanical and, and uh, he has a hard time loosening up. And she might say something and she thinks it's fairly harmless. She might say something to him along the lines of, you know, Kent, why do we have to do the same position all the time? And it seems like I'm the one pleasing you all the time. And it's very little reciprocity here. We're, we're, you're pleasing me. And can you, can you just loosen up and lighten up a little bit? It's, I feel it's just too mechanical for me and, and, and rehearsed. And then he, he goes, oh. And his heart sinks, and it's never, sex is never the same from that point forward because now every time he tries to have sex, he's uh, monitoring his own performance and going, oh, am I doing it right? Am I, am I being playful enough? Am I in the right position? And all of these things just kill sex. It just kills it for him because now he's more interested in performing than he's just lightening up and having fun. You could think in terms of, I'm not going to be able to just magically not have sensory sensitivities and magically move sex into my number one spot since it's in her number one spot. Mm -hmm. But what could happen is to start small. In mm -hmm. your case, the big goal is to have quality, meaningful sex as she defines meaningful sex where the emotional component is there, the physical component is there, and it's all good, and I'm not doing it in some robotic fashion, yada, yada. That's the big goal. So you could come up with some objectives and no doubt some sub-objectives to move in that direction. I could start with, I'm going to just make some things up. I could start with when I get home, when I get home, instead of just bypassing her in the hallway and going straight to the computer room so I can decompress from the, the shitty day I had, I'll walk in the door and I'll hunt her down. I'll go straight to her give her a hug and a kiss on the cheek and, and say, hi, honey, how, you, how was your day? That's it. Just that. Only that. One thing. That could be a sub-objective to a larger objective, which would be I'm going to come home, I'm going to give her a big hug, I'm going to kiss her on the lips, 
and I'm, I'm going to hold that hug for about 30 seconds. And I might even give her two or three kisses smack dab on the lips. I'm just making this up. Yeah. But you understand we're going to escalate, yeah. Yeah. escalate more and more and more. So in summary, start small. And don't worry about rushing. Don't worry about rushing to the big end goal. That'll work against you. Because now you're going to start worrying, oh, it's been three months since I started this uh, one step at a time, keep it simple thing. I wonder if you know, if I'm ever going to get there. And then you start doubting yourself. Mm-hmm. And then you start getting impatient. And Steve, she start getting impatient. And now you, you're back to square one. We don't want that. So the point of this exercise is twofold. One, I want you to recognize this self-condemnation, self-condemnation that you've been engaging in. Why would I want you to even recognize that? Because if you beat up on yourself like this, you're going to be more inclined to feel comfortable beating up on her. If you are really down on yourself, even at an unconscious level chronically, and maybe sometimes expect 110% out of you, you will, you will expect 100% out of her, and you'll be more likely at an unconscious level to chastise her and be cold-hearted to her. So we want you to start the business of disengaging from self-condemnation because you will be more likely to condemn her if you continue to do this to you. What is the opposite of self-condemnation? It's self-compassion. So the moral to this story is, one, I want you to recognize your negative self-talk about yourself. Two, I want you to begin the process of replacing that with some self-compassion inner dialogue. So some of the inner dialogue that we can have that falls in alignment with self-compassion would be, I'm not the first person to have these problems and I won't be the last, but I am growing. I forgive myself and accept my flaws because nobody's perfect. I don't have to let self-doubt or judgment hold me back from the future. It's safe for me to show kindness to myself. My mistakes just show that I'm growing and learning. Changing is never simple, but it's easier if I stop being hard on myself. These types of thoughts will lead to self-compassion. And then, when you have more compassion for you, you will have more compassion for your NT spouse. And now you're delivering the empathy and emotional reciprocity that your NT spouse has wanted for years. We have different forms of shutdowns. Um, I'll give you uh, the ones that are most prominent, and they go from mild to severe. Uh, mild shutdown would be these. The, it's fascinating to me this topic here. The guys with autism spectrum disorder, uh, they do without boring you with a bunch of background information again on mind blindness and executive function deficits. They have learned from a very young age to retreat into their own little inner world. And that's the key term right there. They are often in their inner world. And um, so a mild version of a shutdown would be when you're talking to him about something that is stressing him, even though you may view it as a totally neutral topic, and he is not exhibiting any visible symptoms, doesn't melt down, any version of that, doesn't shut down as far as you can tell, and he sits there and he seems to be paying attention. And you could swear to God he's listening to you. And then he may even chime in every once in a while. Yeah, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, okay, honey. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And then you think, oh, we'll come and you end the conversation. And then later on, if it was a task that you asked him to do, it didn't get done uh, because he forgot. Or when you ask him about something with respect to a, a portion of the conversation that you had a couple of days, he didn't remember having it. Because he wasn't there, he was off in his little fantasy land, which would be a mild version of the shutdown, or shut off in that case. He wasn't totally shut down, but he was kind of shut, semi-shut off. And then uh, I won't give you all the different flavors, but we'll jump to the other end of the spectrum, and that would be where it is a, uh, a version of a shutdown that is a response to anxiety overload. That probably would be the more accurate term anxiety overload, and what's going on in that moment when he seems lost. He seems like a hologram. You can see that he's physically there, but mentally he's clearly off somewhere else. He is, and here's the key word, ladies, 
ruminating about the the traumatic event or the anxiety producing event or events when he's lost in thought he is literally ruminating about the stressful episode whatever that is he is literally again lost in his fantasy world except in this case we might want to call it a nightmare world are shutdowns actually avoidance behavior in other words the individual is simply trying to get out of doing something uncomfortable and how is it different than a meltdown I'm not sure exactly where to draw the line between intentional and involuntary acts with my ASD husband. Well, when it comes to dealing with a person with ASD level 1 or high functioning autism, there aren't too many differences between meltdowns and shutdowns. Both are extreme reactions to relationship difficulties and other unwanted stimuli. Both tend to be the result of long-term unresolved issues rather than the more obvious triggers, and both are almost completely out of control for the person rather than being used as a means to an end, which would either be a tantrum or emotional blackmail. Now, some people on the autism spectrum are more prone to meltdowns, while others lean more towards the shutdown reaction. And it's possible to do both, but this depends greatly on the root cause of the problem. Now, there's a personality component to the reaction with people on the spectrum who are more sure of themselves or more fiercely independent, leaning towards meltdowns rather than shutdowns. But again, there's a wide variance depending on the feelings brought on by the trigger. Some events can make even the most confident person on the spectrum doubt himself. So while a meltdown can be described as rage against a situation, a shutdown tends to be more of a retreat. One prominent behavior that manifests during a shutdown is when the autistic spouse avoids conversation, keeps his distance from his neurotypical spouse, and he engages in his special interest for a lengthy period of time to decompress. Now, as with meltdowns, in a shutdown situation, the person may act irrationally or even in some cases dangerously. Unlike a meltdown, however, the harmful activities are almost always directed at oneself. In worst case scenarios, there could be some self-harm. And in the vast minority of cases, there are reported cases of suicide. As with meltdowns, the cause of a shutdown tends to be cumulative and the trigger may bear little resemblance to the actual problem. The real problems associated with the shutdowns tend to lean towards depression, loneliness, poor self-image, and poor self-worth. Shutdowns can result from extreme events, for example, losing a job or a marriage breakup and so on, but they can also have very small triggers, which simply remind the person of a larger pain. For example, a small incident at work can provoke some long-term insecurities and cause a retreat. A shutdown will move some form of emotional pain to the center of the person's focus, and he may start contemplating what if and if only scenarios. Now, these thoughts are always counterproductive because you can't change the past, and they usually only make the person feel trapped by events. During a shutdown, the individual will want to retreat for lengthy periods of time and will generally not want to have contact with anyone. So you could think of meltdowns as a short circuiting of the brain where he is no longer in cognitive control of his responses. And you could think of a shutdown as simply trying to avoid a meltdown. In other words, he hibernates before he's so overwhelmed that his brain shuts down. So this is a message to the neurotypical wives out there. Uh, your autistic husband, let's say, for example, says something or does something that's hurtful. Okay, that's step number one. And let's say that in this scenario that I'm painting, step number two is you want to talk to him about how that hurts your feelings. We'll call that step number two. And you try to reason with him or emotionalize with him so that he will understand that his behavior resulted in pain for you. So basically you're trying to instill some appropriate healthy guilt in him. That's the whole point of you saying, hey, what you said or did there was hurtful and you want to talk about your feelings. And your motivation for that is you want to instill some healthy guilt in him. You want that to stimulate some emotion in him, in this case, the emotion of guilt. Why would you want to do that? Well, your primary motivation isn't to guilt trip him in the form of revenge, your primary motivation is if he feels a healthy sense of guilt 
about what he has said or done that resulted in my pain, he will change his behavior, right? So that's the last step in the progression here. Unfortunately, you're talking to somebody who's out of touch with his emotions and your emotions. It's called alexithymia. So your method fails and has failed how many times now? Hundreds? So here's the progression again. He says or does something that's hurtful. You try to articulate to him that it was hurtful. You're appealing to his emotions, in this case, healthy guilt, in hopes that he will change behavior. But your message gets lost. You would get it if you had a female friend that you unintentionally did something or said something that was hurtful to her, and she would talk to you about how that felt. You would instantly feel a sense of guilt, and you would want to change your behavior accordingly. So it's not that your husband doesn't want to change his behavior. It's that he doesn't get the connection between the healthy guilt and the behavioral change. There is no healthy guilt trigger to motivate him to change behavior. And you download that as he doesn't give a shit. No, he does. It's that he doesn't feel that healthy sense of guilt about behavior. So therefore, there's no motivation to change behavior. That's why I preach it's best to speak in terms of needs rather than feelings. What she has going on for her that if you have ASD level one, you won't have this going on for you as much. The whole point of this little conversation here is to let you know that the two of you are wired so differently. Why the hell wouldn't you have conflict? Neither party should be thinking that the other party is committing a bunch of sins or atrocities. Here's what she has going for her. Well, first of all, you have logic going for you and high IQ. Um, and you can uh, hyper-focus for extended periods of time on a project. You're great at systematizing, great at thinking in pictures. Um, you have a lot of strengths. Here's some of hers that don't match up with yours very much. This is her social IQ that's no doubt higher than yours if you have ASD level one. She can, guys, she can evaluate human voices, and she can attach an incoming signal with an emotional value. Some of these things that I describe coming from her with her social intelligence, you may not even understand what I'm saying because you're so far, you're so far removed from it. She will be able to decide whether a social signal really matters. What's a social signal? Uh, it's a facial cue or a certain uh, body language that's trying to convey some connection or disconnection. She can decipher prosody. That's spelled P-R-O-S-O-D-Y. It may be a new word for you. Uh, prosody is the additional tones and ways that people add layers to meaning to their spoken words. It's kind of like voice inflection. Prosody is kind of at a deeper level. She's able to generate uniquely different reactions in response to different situations. She's like a chameleon. I'm not talking about masking here. She can change the flavor of her reaction instantly, whatever she needs to do to match up to the situation. She can do that. She will have the ability to intuit what somebody is feeling based on their facial cues, body language, tone of voice, volume of voice. She will be able to, in most cases, maybe not so much with you, but in most cases she is very good at regulating strong emotions. We could also throw in some emotional IQ business too that she's good at. And this would be emotional, aware, emotional self-awareness. This is when her body gives her a physical signal that something is wrong and she pays attention to it, and she can sense what's going on based on how the emotion that she's feeling impacted the physical feeling in her body. You've been accused of not having empathy, no doubt, which I disagree with that. You have empathy, you just don't display your empathy to the degree that she does. Doesn't mean you don't have it. It's just that it's not as visible or as pronounced. I'll, I'll pick one aspect of empathy, she will listen to people when they talk about their issues and provide a lot of facial, verbal, and body language moral support 
which doesn't include trying to offer a solution. She will listen to others, talk about their issues, and she will convey, oh, I, I feel what you're going through. Oh, that must be terrible. And she's not, she won't typically offer a solution. She probably has some friends and family members that will confide in her because they know that when they go to her with some troubling issues, that she will open up her heart to them. She will probably have better impulse control than you do. In other words, for example, she will wait until somebody's done speaking before she speaks. She'll respond to people after they finish what they have to say. She will enjoy socializing with people. Not that you don't, but, but I'm guessing for the most part that's not your cup of tea. Socializing doesn't feel like work to her. It actually feels like play. When you are stuck in a socializing situation that you're not fond of, your battery quickly gets depleted. When she's stuck in social gatherings, for example, her battery gets recharged. You will tend to have one special interest, and hyperfocus is spend a, a, a lot of time with that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. She will tend to have eggs in multiple different baskets. In other words, she will have some special interest in multiple domains of her life, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, financially, vocationally. So she will have a wider spread of interests, whereas yours will be more narrow. You're never going to play major league like she is. Let's just be very clear about that. Her social and emotional intelligence is up here. But you're never going to get up there. And this doesn't make you stupid. This makes you more logical than uh, emotional and more task-oriented than social-oriented. So this, it's not like this is wrong, but she is a major league player, and you're like a little league player on the social and emotional stage. So that was the little backdrop to simply help you understand, okay, well, given the dynamics at play there and how far she is out of my league in the social and emotional sense, and by the way, she's not as high in logic as you, I'm not saying she doesn't have logic, but she does not have the ability to remove emotion from the equation. That's one of your strengths, is when you need to do some serious problem solving and analysis, you have the ability to pull emotions out of the equation. That's not always necessarily a great thing, but many, many times it is, because as soon as you introduce subjectivity into solution hunting, you've made your work much more difficult. You put on your square wheels. But when you can remain objective as you are in the business of solution hunting and you've taken the emotions out of the equation, you've smoothed your path to where it's going to be straight and narrow and you're going to get to that end result that you're searching for much more quickly. You're not, getting good. You're not going to get sidetracked with the emotions. That's why she gets so annoyed with you, because she thinks you should be doing all those things that she can do. And it's worse than that. Not only does she think you're supposed to be able to be doing all these things, when you don't do them, she assigns something else to that behavior. Selfish, insensitive, rigid, uncaring, narcissistic, sociopathic. I'm not important. He doesn't care about me. He can't see my hurt, therefore he doesn't care about my hurt. No, just because I can't see your hurt, if I have emotions blindness, it doesn't mean I don't care about your hurt. So she's expecting you to operate at that high level, and you don't. And then she accuses you of being a, a, a what I run into a lot, as in 100% of the time, in working with people on the autism spectrum is that they have a tendency to think very poorly of themselves. And we will just call this uh, stinking thinking. And as you have experienced, whether you realized it or not, the same old thinking will yield the same old results. So here are some common examples that people on the autism spectrum may face that lead to toxic stinking thinking, followed by its replacement thought to help you shift your focus. Okay, number one, you're a failure, right? No, you're a person who sometimes fails, and that's okay, you'll try again. Number two, you're a product of your past. 
You can't change anything, right? Wrong. Things have happened in the past that influenced your behavior, but you can learn to modify how you think and react. People can and do change, even those on the autism spectrum. Number three, you make a ton of social mistakes and you don't deserve good things in life. Correct? Incorrect. What you did may have been awkward socially, but you can forgive yourself and try again. Next, it's easier to avoid this problem than to face it. No. In the long run, it's better to face this problem and accept your role in it. Then there can be a resolution and improved relationships. Next, things always go wrong for me. Right? Wrong. You must accept that things will go wrong sometimes, and that's not a big problem in most cases. Next, this problem shouldn't have happened. I'm to blame or my spouse is to blame. Nope, you might very well be at fault sometimes. Your spouse is at fault sometimes, but neither you nor your spouse are to be blamed because we all make mistakes and we can improve based on the lesson learned. Next, to be worthy and have high self-esteem, you have to be competent and victorious in all respects. Uh-uh, you can't expect to be perfect it's okay to make mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. It's only a failure if you make a mistake but refuse to learn from it. Here's the term grossly. I want you to visualize grossly being a word that's font of 72, bold, red, italicized, underlined, exclamation point. You have grossly underestimated the severity of this disorder. You weren't even in the parking lot, let alone in the ballpark. Why? Because he seems to do fine in so many other areas of life. Walks fine, talks fine, looks fine, works fine. He has friends at work and he, maybe he's one of the best employees. He does well in all other areas of life, but when it comes to me, suddenly he's full-blown autistic. And you're right because he's never more challenged, never more challenged than when he's trying to deal with you. Why is that? Because ASD level one is by definition, we could call it a deficit in social skills and emotional literacy. So his emotional skills and social skills are way down here. Yours, Way up here, you are very emotionally, socially intelligent. He is not. You're very emotionally and socially skilled. He's not. You're very intuitive. He's not. You have a lot of social and emotional needs. He does not. He could go all year and not talk about feelings. Now, I'm not saying he has no social skills. He has social skills when it revolves around his special interests or tasks or work. And I'm not saying he doesn't have any emotions. I am saying he chopped it off at the neck because emotions, you're, especially your emotions when you're animated are too anxiety producing. So he has learned to shut them off purely as a survival mechanism to cope with life that's full of anxiety. He's dodging paintballs all day due to the mind blindness, alexithymia, executive functions and anxiety. So, you have grossly underestimated how severe this is. And you have made a ton of false assumptions. I'm not important to him. He doesn't love me, doesn't care about me. His work's more important than I am. And you've made all of these evaluations and judgment calls. And I'm not saying he can never be insensitive. I'm not saying he can never be an asshole. I'm sure he can but the other 90% of the time, the stuff that you wanted to label as insensitivity and, and selfishness and narcissism and so on was directly the result of one of the traits of the disorder. And this isn't to get him off the hook, by the way. He's very much on the hook. You could pick some random person off the street with autism, and he has paid the price for having these traits. And in many cases, I'm sure there's some ladies in here where this is the case with your husband, when he was young, when he was a child, he couldn't make it, couldn't quite fit in, rejected by peers, ridiculed, ostracized, teased, bullied, labeled a problem child by parents, or they realized he had a 
special needs, and so they spoil the fuck out of him. Then he grows up, finds you, for whatever reason, which I can probably guess, you were attracted to him, and in the early going of the relationship, you were his special interest. That's why it seemed to work out so great. So, although some entities will go, no, it really wasn't that great from the beginning. But in in more often than not, he appeared fairly neurotypical because he wanted you to like him. And so there was some masking going on. But more than that, you were his special interest during that time. So you probably did get at least some degree of validation, give and take in conversation, affection, sex, compassion, grace, mercy, and so on. But then when the newness of the relationship wore off, he gravitated back to his primary special interest, drifted away from the relationship, didn't even know he was doing it. And then you woke up one morning and go, something is off. Something's off. You did your research. Oh, there's this thing called Asperger's syndrome or high-functioning autism. I think he has it. And then you kind of did your research and and now here you are today. Most of the time, a wife's resentment will show up as something like, you don't treat me special like you used to, or you don't spend enough time with me, or we never have sex anymore, and so on. So if a husband is not spending enough time with his spouse or neglects her intentionally or unintentionally, then there's some validity to her complaints. Most women become resentful because they realize that they're ASD level one husbands have ceased to be the men in their life that they need. Routine is the biggest enemy of many marriages. After several years together, the couple gets used to one another and their feelings change. But it's the wife, more often than the autistic husband, who can't accept this change and feels unhappy. Now, some wives adjust themselves to what is now the new normal. For example, less sex, less affection, spending less time together, and so on. But even though the couple in this situation may enjoy a fairly stable, affectionless relationship, the marriage may be slowly falling apart without anyone really noticing it. So how can you tell if your neurotypical wife is actually discontented in your marriage? If she often appears sad or irritated, she keeps finding reasons to spend time away from you, it seems as though she initiates arguments over the most petty of issues. She too has lost interest in sex, or it appears that she's looking for reasons to lash out at you, even if you haven't done anything seriously wrong. If that's the case, you know that discontent is present. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that your wife doesn't love you. More likely, she's tired of the routine, the responsibilities, and the never changing everyday chores and tasks. So it sounds like your wife has taken on way too much responsibility for things and is in burnout mode, we'll call it, which isn't entirely your fault. This was a choice she's made. Now you said that she had to be a caretaker as a child. It's very likely that she brought that trait into your marriage. So my best guess is that she feels more like your mother than your wife. The truth is that men on the autism spectrum, by virtue of mind blindness, have difficulty empathizing and imagining how another person may feel. So as hard as it may be for you, somebody with ASD level one, try to put yourself in your spouse's position. If you were your wife, what changes would you like to see? What would you want to work on in the relationship? What would you want to talk about? What issues would you need to address? If you can come up with answers to those questions, you may be able to empathize with what's going on inside of her. I would resist the temptation to continually ask your wife what's wrong. Instead, propose to talk about it. And when you do, talk in an apologizing, caring tone. Ask what you can do to help. Listen to understand rather than to mount a defense. Your attitude and behavior have an influence even if your wife is not aware of it. And it better be a calm and reassuring one if you want to reestablish trust and build back the bond. You may not feel like going through all of this, believing that you're the one who should be comforted, but your wife is obviously bothered with her emotional state as much as you are. So even though it's normal to feel insulted and upset, try to find the inner strength to feel compassion for her. Compassion is an action. In other words, I care about this person and I'm going to do and say what I need to do to make her feel safe in this relationship. If he were here, he would say, you know, I always feel like I'm letting her down. 
I never meet her expectations. Any, it seems to me, in his demo of mind, it seems to me that it doesn't matter what I say or do, it's never good enough. I always feel like I'm failing. He's also equating you wanting to continue to refine the marriage and the relationship, and what wouldn't you? He's, he's making the mistake that because she's wanting to continue to refine means she's unhappy. Not necessarily. There's probably sometimes when you were trying to fine tune the relationship or at least keep it from going off the rails and you were unhappy. But just because she, whoever she is, wants to work on the relationship, which, by the way, everybody's supposed to be doing until you're dead. He make, he's, his download is because she continues to work on the relationship. Actually, he wouldn't even he wouldn't even call it that because she continues to complain about the relationship. Therefore, she's unhappy. The the accurate, the positive reframe that he's not going to use is she cares about me. She cares about the relationship. That's why she's trying to continue to work on it from getting worse and, and try to make it better. And just because she's doing that doesn't mean she's unhappy. You're not responsible for his downloads. If he's downloading it as, uh, well, you're just so critical and you're you're impossible to please and, and your expectations are too high, that doesn't mean you're doing all that shit. That just simply means that's his download. You need to look at the difference between of the things that he accuses me of. Remember, we're talking about a positive reframe is to get in alignment, as close to alignment with reality as possible. Mm -hmm. Is the stuff that he's accusing me of in alignment with reality? Or is it way out of reality? It's just that it happens to be the way he's skewing reality in his downloads. <music>